Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Biopharma 101, Analysis of Adeno-Associated Virus Vectors. I am Kaylee Bach of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by SciEx. To learn more, visit SciEx.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Stephen Calciano, Market Development Manager, Biopharma CE at SciEx, and Paula Orens, Market Development Manager, Biopharma MS at SciEx. Stephen, Paula, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Biopharma 101, Analysis of Adeno-Associated Virus Vectors. My name is Stephen, and I'm a Market Development Manager here at SciEx. I'm joined by my colleague, Paula Orens, and together we're going to be providing an overview of AAV-based gene therapy characterization workflows. Before we dive into the adeno-associated viral vector analysis workflows, let's take a moment to discuss the background of AAV, its components of interest, a typical AAV manufacturing process, as well as its associated analytical challenges. AAV is the short name for adeno-associated virus. It's also one of the most widely used delivery vehicles in gene therapy due to its non-pathogenicity, low immunogenicity, and broad tropism to infect multiple cell types. This feature makes AAV particularly interesting for a variety of genetic disease indications, as the capsid can be tailored toward the specific cell type in vivo. Adeno-associated virus is an icosahedral virus with a protein shell, referred to as a capsid, that is assembled of three viral proteins, named VP1, VP2, and VP3, in an ideal ratio of 1 to 1 to 10. Let's take a look at the wild type AAV genome. It contains two ITRs, a rep gene, a cap gene, and a poly A signal. The entire genome size is around 4.7 KB. Each of these components plays a role in the AAV multiplication and incorporation into the host cell genome. The ITR, or inverted terminal repeat, sequence comprises 145 bases each. It's an important for AAV multiplication, encapsidation, and integration into the host cell genome. The rep gene encodes four proteins with overlapping sequences. They are required for gene regulation and replication of the AAV. The cap gene encodes three capsid proteins, VP1, VP2, and VP3, with a molecular weight of 87, 72, and 62 kilodaltons and a non-structural protein named AAP, or assembly activating protein. The AAV capsid is composed of a mixture of these three proteins totaling 60 monomers arranged in an icosahedral symmetry in the ideal ratio of 1 to 1 to 10, with an estimated size of 3.9 megadaltons. AAP is essential for the capsid assembly process. And the poly-A tail is, is used for the polyadenylation signal. Now let's take a look at the recombinant AAV genome. In the recombinant AAV genome, we still have two ITRs, but the rep gene and cap gene have been replaced by a transgene and a promoter region that regulates the transgene expression. The transgene is also called the therapeutic gene, depending on the size of the transgene. The intact genome size for a recombinant AAV can be anywhere from about two kilobases to five kilobases. Since there is no rep and cap gene in the recombinant AAV genome, the recombinant AAV can't replicate by itself. That is a very important safety feature for recombinant AAV-based therapeutics. This slide shows the three plasmid system for making recombinant AAV, also known as the triple transfection system. As I mentioned earlier, the recombinant AAV genome does not contain the cap and rep gene it is replication deficient. In order to make more virons or viral particles, we need three plasmids. 
The first plasmid contains the entire recombinant AAV genome, including the transgene. The second, helper plasmid, provides the rep gene and the capsid. The third plasmid provides the AAV-derived genes that are essential for the replication of the virus. After the packaging host cell is transfected with these plasmids, the host cell can make recombinant AAV virons. This slide shows the typical manufacturing and purification process of recombinant AAV at a small scale. First, the host cells are transfected with the three AAV plasmid system. The host cells will make recombinant AAV. Then the cells are harvested by centrifugation. After the cells are resuspended, they are lysed by sonication. Then the host cell genome and plasmid DNA are digested with nuclease. The clarified lysate is loaded for ultra centrifugation, and the contents of the clarified lysate will separate to different layers where the recombinant AAV can be removed is then purified by chromatography and buffer exchanged to the final formulation buffer. Recombinant AAV-based gene therapies represent an analytical challenge due to the complexity associated with various genome sizes, serotypes, and sample heterogeneity associated with the empty and partially filled capsids and small size impurities present in the sample. Biopharma scientists often use multiple platforms to assess a variety of critical quality attributes. However, each platform does have its own inherent limitations. All in all, comprehensive adeno-associated virus analysis is time consuming and establishing robust analytical methods early in development is required to ensure the success of AAV-based product development. Here we see a list of AAV quality considerations and their related impacts to gene therapy drug potency, immunogenicity, transduction efficiency, and packaging efficiency. Often, these quality considerations are deemed as critical quality attributes that must be monitored throughout the AAV-based gene therapy development process to ensure the safety and the efficacy of the product. For example, the viral protein profile has been shown to indicate vector potency, immunogenicity, transduction efficiency, and packaging efficiency. The genome integrity, AAV titer, full and empty capsid ratio all influence vector potency, immunogenicity, and transduction efficiency. Additionally, the presence of protein or nucleic acid impurities impacts the vector potency and immunogenicity of the therapy. Now that we've taken a look at the background of AAV-based therapeutics and their related manufacturing workflows, let's overview the key analytical workflows for AAV-based gene therapies that we'll be discussing in the next section of this presentation. The first part of this presentation will focus on capillary electrophoresis-based methods. Here, we'll discuss viral protein monitoring, which includes a quantitative ratio assessment of the capsid proteins and related protein impurities. Additionally, we'll discuss genome integrity, and this assay analyzes the encapsidated transgene quality, as well as residual process-related nucleic acids, um, as well as a workflow to calculate the full to empty capsid ratio. Then we'll conclude with LCMS-based workflows for AAV structural characterization at both the intact and the peptide level. Our first analytical workflow helps to better understand capsid protein quality through determination of the viral protein ratio, as well as providing the ability to screen samples for protein impurities with very high resolution. Purity assessment of adeno-associated virus is important to ensure the quality and safety of all AAV-based products. Also, it's important to have high sensitivity detection to enable analysis of low titer samples, as is common when developing the manufacturing process and scaling up during development. The key workflow we'll discuss in this next section is capillary electrophoresis using sodium dodecosulfate with laser-induced fluorescence detection. The acronym used for this workflow is CESDS-LIF. It's important to understand how CESDS-LIF compares to other protein analysis methodologies. So in this slide, we will review two analysis techniques which are common in the industry, SDS-PAGE 
and reversed phase high-performance liquid chromatography. On the left, we can see an example image from a manually prepared SDS page gel with a protein standard ladder on the far left side of the image and eight AAV samples analyzed in the lanes labeled one through eight. While separation is achieved with this SDS page gel, these assays suffer from lack of precision, poor quantitative performance, and user-to-user -user variability. On the right side of this slide, we can see two example chromatograms generated using reversed phase chromatography. This separation is based on retention of the various viral protein capsids, with the elution order and resolution being a function of hydrophobicity of the sample components. This results in elution order changes depending on the particular AAV serotype used. We can see AAV serotype A on the top chromatogram shows VP2, then VP3, then VP1 in the chromatogram elution order, while the AAV serotype B shows VP2 followed by VP1, then VP3. This changing elution order makes it a requirement to redevelop methods for each development program, uh, depending on the serotype, and precludes the ability to generate platform separation methods. Additionally, the resolution between viral capsid proteins is non-optimal, as we can see some co-elution, especially in serotype B. At a high level, capillary electrophoresis is the application of traditional slab gel electrophoresis, or SDS page, in a capillary using linear polymers in a solution to create a molecular sieve. This allows molecules that have a similar charge to size ratio to be resolved by hydrodynamic size. The separation is based on the analyte's differential migration through the gel matrix and is solely based on hydrodynamic size differences. However, to characterize by molecular mass, the same charge on all proteins is required. This is achieved through the use of an anionic detergent, sodium dodex sulfate, which complexes with proteins at a constant ratio of 1 to 1.4. In addition, reducing reagents like beta mercaptoethanol can be introduced to the sample to reduce disulfide bonds and further denature the protein. Upon the application of voltage, the proteins migrate through the gel matrix with the similar proteins migrating quickest and the larger proteins migrating more slowly. The CESDS workflow for viral capsid proteins starts with a sample pretreatment protocol to denature the viral capsid into its substituent protein components, as we mentioned, which are VP1, VP2, and VP3. For UV-based detection, this is accomplished by diluting the AAV sample with an incubation buffer of 100 millimolar Tris HCl at pH 9 with 1% SDS and 2 beta mercaptoethanol at elevated temperatures for 10 minutes. Samples are then diluted with water and subsequently analyzed by CE. For high sensitivity detection with laser-induced fluorescence, samples are denatured with the same incubation buffer in the presence of DTT and chromio P503 dye, which tags the protein and enables fluorescence-based detection. Once the voltage is applied, the viral proteins migrate through the gel matrix with the proteins migrating in the order of increasing size. An example electropherogram is shown on the right side of the slide. Capillary electrophoresis provides high resolution separation and enables detection of all three viral proteins, as well as a closely related protein impurity, labeled in the graph as VP3 prime. One of the major advantages to capillary electrophoresis for viral protein profiling is its ability to provide a platform approach to analyzing AAVs. Capillary gel electrophoresis is based on the principle of a high-resolution size-based separation and can analyze multiple AAV serotypes without requiring intensive method development. The electropherogram shown in this slide demonstrate that multiple AAV serotypes, including AAV1, AAV2, and AAV8, can all be analyzed with high resolution in a serotype-independent manner. This workflow also enables accurate capsid protein titer determination. In this example, we can see a serial dilution of an AAV capsid protein sample with known titer. The method demonstrates good linearity with an R-squared value of 0.997,
and a limit of quantitation of 6.4 e to the 9 gc per ml. Running an unknown sample against this calibration curve can serve as a reliable method to determine protein titer, especially from low concentration samples. This protein titer data can be used to determine the full to empty product ratio when combined with the genome integrity data we'll cover in the next section. The genome integrity workflow is used to characterize the integrity of the encapsulated genomic material in the AAV capsid, as well as screen AAV samples for process-related nucleic acid impurities. This is an important method because the quality of the encapsulated genome inside a viral vector impacts the infectivity, efficacy, and safety of the gene therapy. There are many ways in which a transgene in the genome cassette can be produced, including a missing or not present transgene, resulting in an empty or partial capsid, a truncated transgene, or a capsid containing contaminant fragments from the host cell or process plasmids. The key workflow we will discuss in this section is capillary gel electrophoresis with laser-induced fluorescence, also called CGELIF. There are two sample pretreatment workflows compatible with the genome integrity assay. The first workflow, depicted in the graph at the top of the slide, is used for analyzing the encapsulated genomic material only. In that assay, we take the AAV sample and treat it with nuclease to remove the nucleic acids outside of the protein capsids. Then we treat the sample with protease and perform a nucleic acid extraction using a PCR prep kit. To analyze the nucleic acid components, both encapsulated in the viral particle, as well as the process-related host cell impurities, like host cell DNA and RNA, we can go directly to the nucleic acid extraction workflow with the PCR prep kit, and then analyze with capillary gel electrophoresis. Now let's take a look at a sample electropherogram to give you an idea of what you can expect when running high resolution genome integrity analysis via capillary gel electrophoresis. In this electropherogram, starting at the left, you can see a grouping of various process and product related impurities. The first initial hump is related to host cell DNA and host cell RNA, as indicated by the two first arrows on the left. In the middle, uh, again, based on size separation, we can see partial genome or contaminant fragments that were released from the capsid, including a partial capsid uh, with a truncated gene, as well as a capsid which had contained a contaminant fragment. All the way on the right side of the electropherogram, we can see the single-stranded DNA with the target therapeutic gene in the nice sharp peak with an intact genome size estimated at 2.4 kilobases. When running a standard ladder against the standard, it's easy to estimate the size of the intact genome peak and confirm the identity of your uh, full-length genome material. Here we can see another example of running two different AAV um, samples with two different encapsulated genomes. The first sample is an AAV serotype 2 containing the LACZ gene. We can see the profile, similar to what we saw in the previous slide, where we have small size impurities uh, related to host cell DNA and RNA, a partial genome, and the intact genome of the LACZ gene at 4.7 kilobases in the blue trace. In the green trace, we can see the same AAV2 serotype with the GFP genome encapsulated. We see the same characteristic trace with small size process-related impurities, the partial genome material, and a smaller size intact genome peak estimated at 2.4 kilobases. Here in the bottom, we can see an example RNA ladder. This is an SS RNA ladder, which can be used to calibrate and estimate the size of the uh, genes in the first two samples. Uh, it's important to note that when doing this, uh, the RNA ladder is uh, single-stranded RNA, but from AAV, our intact genome and encapsulated genome are all SS single-strand DNA. 
So it's important to provide a correction factor to accommodate for the slight change in migration time, but when applied, this workflow can provide a, an easy way to estimate the size of your intact genome peak. Similar to how our viral protein profiling assay was serotype independent, the genome integrity assay to assess the integrity of the encapsulated genomic material is also serotype independent. Here is an example of a high throughput serotype independent workflow exhibiting uh, four different AAV serotypes, including AAV9 in pink, AAV8 in dark blue, AAV5 in light blue, and AAV2 in green. We can see characteristic profiles of the impurities, both process and partial product related impurities, uh, and the sharp peaks for the intact genome, all at around four, uh, upwards of four kilobases, as reported by the um, standard ladder. Following the same idea that we saw with the viral protein uh, titer assay, we can also use capillary electrophoresis to assess the genome titer of uh, our AAV sample. So here we can see the separation of AAV genome extracted from serial diluted standards with known titer. Uh, so we've created an eight point calibration curve and plotted corrected peak area versus AAV titer reported in GC per ml. We can see excellent linearity uh, from this uh, calibration curve with an R-squared value of 0.9967 and a reported limit of detection of 1.28 e to the 10 GC per ml and a limit of quantitation of 2.56 e to the 10 GC per ml, making this assay applicable to running lower concentration samples that you may encounter during process optimization and development. The final CE-based application that we'll discuss is full and empty capsid ratio monitoring to analyze the assembled drug substance. Here, we'll discuss how full capsids deliver intact transgene into target cells, and full capsids directly impact the potency of AAV-based therapeutics. So monitoring the full and empty capsid ratio is important during process optimization to remove empty and partial capsids for better efficacy during your process development and ensure the safety of your AAV-based gene therapy. Uh, this workflow is a, not another analysis um, analytical workflow from the separation, but in this case, we're going to be calculating the empty to full product ratio from protein and genome titer assays that we discussed in the previous two workflows using those two data sets to determine our full and empty ratio. Comprehensive analysis of AAV critical quality attributes can be achieved using capillary electrophoresis. On the left side of the slide, we see all of the characteristics that our viral protein characterization assay, CESDS-LIF, can enable, including viral protein profile and ratio, assessment of protein impurities, and the determination of any degradation of viral capsid proteins. This assay can also determine our capsid titer. On the right-hand side of the slide in green, we have our genome integrity assay, leveraging capillary gel electrophoresis with laser-induced fluorescence. This viral genome ana analysis enables um, a quick workflow to assess our transgene purity and genome sizing estimation from our small size, you know, uh, encapsulated genomic material all the way up to our full-length target genes of about five kilobases. When we take our genome titer and divide by our protein titer, we get a very quick and easy way to assess the full, partial, and empty ratio, thus yielding a novel approach for high resolution, full and empty AAV capsid analysis. So now let's look at an example of calculating uh, the full um, capsid percentage using this standard workflow. So for this example, we've uh, use an AAV8 serotype 8 sample reference standard from Vigene. And the value A was determined from the genome integrity analysis assay using capillary gel electrophoresis at 2.21 e to the 12 GC per ml. Value B 
was uh, from the AAV capsid analysis workflow, protein characterization workflow, uh, using capillary uh, electrophoresis, sodium dodecyl sulfite, laser-induced fluorescence, with a value reported of 2.65 e to the 12 GC per ml. So calculating, you know, dividing our genome titer by our capsid titer uh, in the AAV8 test sample, we get a, uh, a value of 83.4% full capsid. Comparing our value to industry standard techniques that are often a bit more involved to use, but often result in reliable analytical results, puts us squarely between transmission electron microscopy and analytical ultracentrifugation. So I encourage you to take a look at the Vigene webinars if you have any um, questions about how those data were generated on TEM and AUC. But as you can see, the CE generated data from the resultant calculation of viral protein um, titer and genome titer using capillary gel electrophoresis results in um, a value that is very consistent with the industry standard techniques. Now I would like to uh, hand off the presentation to my colleague Paula Orens, who is going to take us through some capsid protein characterization workflows using liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. So thanks, Paula. Over to you. Thanks, Stephen, for providing such a great overview. I am going to switch gears a bit and focus on capsid proteins. Now we've learned how to perform purity assessments with capillary electrophoresis, but we're going to take a closer look at the VPs or viral proteins because they are the primary interface between the host and the genetic material that we're trying to deliver. Now these proteins encapsulating that genetic material are made up of three VPs, VP1, VP2, and VP3. They range in size about a third to half the size of a typical MAB, but the kicker, and one of many, uh, is that they're derived from the same genome through alternative splicing, meaning they share the same C terminus, but they have different N termini, as you can see depicted in this image below. By using intact mass analysis with LCMS, we can determine if they were expressed properly. We can confirm molecular weight and compare it to the theoretical mass. Additionally, we can use intact mass analysis to understand the overall integrity of the proteins, provide an overview of the modifications, since the proteins share quite a bit of sequence, and understand the protein impurities. Then the next workflow we'll utilize to characterize the VPs is peptide mapping. And here we'll be able to localize any of those modifications and confirm the sequence of the proteins. Remember, we only did molecular weight confirmation with intact mass, not primary sequence confirmation. Some of the challenges associated with AAV sample analysis is the limited sample quantity and the highly similar sequence of the VPs, and in turn, highly similar, highly similar physical properties. These similarities lead to difficulties with separation, associating the modifications with the accurate VP, or basically just getting an accurate hold of the sample. So to combat these, some scientists will employ micro or nano LC to minimize the sample that's utilized in separation or implement ion pairing agents like TFA or DFA. But I'm going to show you how we can avoid all of those parameters. This is an overview or a, a nice schematic providing the overview of the two workflows that I'm going to focus on today. You can see following one will be the intact mass analysis workflow and following number two will be following the peptide mapping workflow. Now, as I started with intact mass on the last slide, that's where we're going to begin today. For the intact mass analysis, you can see the sample, sample preparation is fast. It's typically a denaturation step to break the capsids apart, maybe a buffer exchange, but that typically depends on how you've stored or treated your sample. And sometimes if you are doing a buffer exchange, it's because you have to remove the buffer so that it's not interfering with the ionization on the mass spec. Uh, but in general, we're using an LC approach at analytical flow rates coupled to an accurate mass system. In this case, it's the Xenotof 7600, a QTOF system. 
And then the data is going to be processed by Biologics Explorer, which is a SIEC, SIEC's processing software for, you guessed it, processing biologics. Like I said previously, this experiment is very simple. There are no mobile phase modifiers and we're sticking with analytical flow, making it simple and easy to use. Plus there are no mobile phase modifiers impacting the sensitivity of the assay. In this experiment, we're using generic AAV2, not therapeutic AAV2 because we were just establishing the workflow and the genetic material wasn't of relevance. To solve the separation, because we're not using mobile phase modifiers, we used a specific deconvolution approach to deconvolute scan by scan, which helps to identify all the proteins even when they are co-eluting. You can see on the left-hand side, some of the VPs are co-eluting. So we have the ion map of the TOF MS data, which is a nice way to see all the VPs, but also check for potential impurities. On the right-hand side is the time-resolved deconvoluted data, or TRD, which allows all of the acquired data throughout the entirety of the acquisition to be deconvoluted, meaning we're not only seeing information about VPs, but also potential other forms that we might not have anticipated. Now, this approach means that there is very low risk to missing proteins, impurities, even when they're of low abundance. Gene Leap Bio from Luye has been working on two different cell systems to assemble their viral particles. So we're no longer looking at that generic AAV2 from the last slide. You can see on the right, those two different systems result in different ratios of modifications. On the top layer, we can see the three VP derived, the three viral proteins derived from cell line SF9, which happens to be an insect cell line. And below is a human cell line, HEC293, and all of those, those three VPs associated with that human cell line. There is a significant difference in the modification patterns of the three VPs, and this is known to impact the quality of the virus and cellular uptake. So understanding these differences and not missing any potential protein impurities through a comprehensive approach of analyzing the data can and will be very helpful. Looking deeper into the modifications, you can see a few acetylations specifically on VP1 and VP3 of both cell lines, as well as phosphorylations. And phosphorylations are very similar in mass to sulfation, and both modifications can exist in AAV samples, so we wanted to make sure that we were properly identifying the modification. To confirm that we're looking at phosphorylations, samples were treated with phosphatase and compared before and after. On the top, on the right side, we have the before treatment depicted, then below that are the after treatment of the three proteins. Now the peaks which were previously assigned to phosphorylation are either gone or have been significantly reduced, which confirms the phosphorylation peak and not a sulfated peak. Now we cannot understand the exact localization of that or any modification using this approach, especially not modifications that will shift the mass by a very small value. So because of this, we're going to apply that second approach that I introduced very briefly earlier of peptide mapping. With peptide mapping, we'll start by denaturing the proteins to break, them, break apart the capsids. Then the proteins are reduced to break any secondary structure bonds or holding the, the proteins together internally. And then it's alkylated to keep those bonds from reforming. Lastly, the proteins were triptychally digested to create a mixture of peptides that we're going to separate using LCMS-MS, again on the Xenotof 7600 system using analytical flow rate and Biologics Explorer to process the data. Peptide mapping can answer some additional questions that cannot be resolved by intact mass analysis. For instance, we've already seen that the molecular weight matches the theoretical molecular weight, but we haven't proven the amino acid sequence matches the theoretical amino acid sequence. For modifications, we can understand exactly where they are localized or located, 
especially for something like deamidations, which are incredibly important for AAV samples, as it's been shown that deamidated AAVs can impact the efficacy of the delivery. And deamidations have a very small mass shift, so it's almost impossible to discern it at an intact level, which is why we're going to utilize peptide mapping to do exactly that. Let's start by looking at the sequence information. And one problem that I'm going to come back to is the, the limited protein sample in this case. Uh, but first, what we can see here is that the primary sequence of VP1, which is the largest of the three proteins, and it includes the sequences of VP2 and VP3. Now with only a single triptych digestion and a single injection, we achieved about 95% sequence coverage even with the sample being severely limited. Now to combat that limited sample and very low sensitivity or protein amount, uh, one option would be to inject a lot of the sample. Uh, but these samples are typically quite costly. That's why they come in such limited amounts. And then another method would be to use micro or nano LC, but those systems are difficult to maintain and it makes the method development and deployment of the method extremely complex. Instead of deploying either of those techniques, we're using a Xenotop 7600, which has the capability of xenotropping. Uh, but to make sure you have the generic understanding of how a QTOF system typically works, I've got this schematic for you here. Uh, and what I'm talking about right now is called the duty cycle. And that is the percentage of ions that are injected into the TOF region or the flight tube, but it's basically the percentage of ions that are making it to the detector. Now with a generic QTOF instrument, there is a constant stream of ions being passed through the quadrupole and into the accelerator region but only a portion of those ions will actually be pulsed into the flight tube. And that's because the act of the TOF accelerator is a non-constant action. It pulses, it pushes, which means that the rest of the ions are lost. And this is about a five to 25% duty cycle for your standard QTOF instrument, meaning only five to 25% of ions are making it to the detector. Whereas the rest of the ions that we've worked so hard for or with AVs that are so limited, only 75% or rather 75% of those ions are being lost. With the Xenotoph 7600, you can see that we've employed or we've added these gates uh, to allow us to have a trapping technique that ensures a significantly higher percentage of ions are being delivered to the detector, and it only happens when necessary. So for instance, if a peptide in very low abundance comes through this region, um, xenotrapping will be engaged. So the ions are getting trapped by this xenogate and the IQ3, and they will only be released once the TOF accelerator is ready to push into the flight tube again. So they go from this trapped region, they're pushed into the accelerator, and then only then does the accelerator push those ions into the flight tube. So this ensures a significantly better duty cycle we're getting much closer to 100%, if not achieving 100% of those ions getting to the detector, which is so important, especially in instances of AAVs where the sample is so severely limited. And that limited sample has many modifications in very low abundance. What does the Xenotrap look like when engaged, you ask? Uh, think back earlier to the intact mass analysis. We confirmed there were acetylated and phosphorylated modifications on the VPs. And using peptide mapping, we'll be able to localize exactly where those modifications occur. This is typically done using collision-induced dissociation, or CID. And for some peptides, this is a very sufficient method. We've got comprehensive information to localize the acetylation and phosphorylation, even in cases where there are multiple positions that could carry the modification. It's great data quality that is made possible by xenotrapping and CID together, 
However, there are instances where PTMs can be a lot more challenging to elucidate using CID. So for this, we have electron activated dissociation or EAD. EAD is a tunable kinetic energy and a novel fragmentation mechanism which results in orthogonal fragmentation patterns when compared to CID. CID produces B and Y fragments, whereas EAD produces C and Z fragments. And this is particularly important during deamidation events to be able to have this orthogonal fragmentation, because in many cases, deamidation is considered a critical quality attribute, or CQA, because deamidation in the capsid, capsid protein can affect the viral uptake. So they can also lead to aspartate and isospartate formations, and there could be different forms in low abundance. Other fragmentation techniques cannot differentiate those different isobaric amino acids like EAD can. EAD can produce specific fragments which allow for differentiation of those isobaric amino acids. And the difference on the side chain of these amino acids can even lead to different behavior in the protein. So it's very important to understand where there is an aspartate versus an isoaspartate. And we can see EAD produces those C and Z frag fragments rather than that B and Y ions, like I said. And with EAD, we are identifying these diagnostic fragments of Z minus 44 for identifying aspartate amino acids and Z minus 57 to identify isoaspartate. In the interest of time, I won't go into any more detail. I know I can speak about this topic for days, and I'm sure Stephen is, is quite the same. Uh, but I will quickly reiterate the different workflows that you can implement across capillary electrophoresis and mass spectrometry platforms to characterize product and process-related impurities, capsid analysis, genome integrity, full to empty capsid ratios, as well as determining the integrity of all VPs including high-level information on modifications and critical quality attributes. So feel free to reach out to Stephen or I if you are interested in learning any more about any of the workflows that we've described in the last few minutes. But until then, I want to thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you again. Thank you, Stephen and Paula, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. All right, so let's get started. Our first question is, can the viral protein profiling and genome integrity workflows using capillary gel electrophoresis be used for in-process samples? Yes, hi, Kaylee. That's a, that's a great question. And um, while typically these analysis techniques have been applied to um, formulated samples, we have had customers employ these methods for in-process analysis. Um, so especially when using the laser-induced fluorescence detector with uh, P503 labeled capsid protein, um, you know, there are some considerations, but it is possible to use these um, workflows for in-process analysis. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Our next question here is for Paula, and this question asks, were any other deamidated species identify, identified excuse me, by MS? Absolutely. Uh, so deamidation is an important quality attribute because it affects the function of the AAV. Um, so using EAD, we also identified the YLG peptide was deamidated in addition to that TWL peptide that I, that I just showed you. Um, and I'll say it's worth noting that the order of evolution for the ASP and ISOASP amino acids were opposite for the two peptides. So we can't rely solely on the retention time to identify those different isomers. 
Um, so EAD was a really important functionality so that we could identify that Z minus 44 and Z minus 57 to be able to di di differentiate between the, the isomers. Great, thanks Paula. I have another question here for Steven. This one asks, is it required to use the fluorescence detector for AAV analysis? So depending on the workflow, it, it may be required. So for the genome integrity assay, um, we typically are using the laser. And for the uh, protein um, capsid assay, uh, we can use UV or the, the laser. So it's just depending, uh, overall the workflow is depending, and the detector options depend on the sensitivity requirements for the assay. Um, and we can share information about um, the dynamic range of the assay and changes based on the detector options that are selected. So uh, not required, but helpful for when dealing with um, lower concentration samples. Great, thank you. We've got some great questions coming in from our audience. This next one here, to what extent uh, must AAV samples be purified beforehand prior to being applied to the system. I assume using crude extract is not feasible, right? Yeah, so this is um, this is a good question. I'm assuming this is um, talking about capillary electrophoresis, um, but feel free to, to you know, correct me via the uh, chat if I'm wrong. But um, so AAV samples, you know, when, when analyzing um, uh, process related samples, um, we have experience using a buffer exchange workflow prior to analysis where we um, either use diluted formulation uh, buffer or even undiluted formulation buffer, just depending on, you know, if we're using the laser or not and, and if we have enough signal from our sample. So um, what a, a quick um, buffer exchange into formulation buffer is usually uh, all that we need in order to analyze the samples um, by the viral protein or the genome integrity assay. Great, thank you, Stephen. Paula, I have another question coming your way. This question asks, can you explain how the samples were deconvoluted? Cool, okay. Um, so the TRD or uh, Time Resolved Deconvolution Activity Node in Biologics Explorer is particularly suited to accurately deconvolute components that are poorly resolved chromatographically by deconvoluting the data scan by scan. Um, additionally, unexpected low abundance impurities, which might not be visible as peaks in the total ion chromatogram or the TIC, the TIC, uh, can be deconvoluted and found leveraging those 3D plots that I shared with you earlier. While traditional deconvolution approaches, um, MS scans over a defined retention time range are summed or averaged. The algorithm, algorithm used for TRD enables deconvolution of each TOF MS scan across the retention time range separately. So information on deconvoluted masses and the corresponding retention times is preserved and connected for all species, further enabling users to detect expected alongside um, unexpected species. I, I find myself talking with my hands a lot, but you can't see me. <laughs> Um, so for this application, the AAV8 capsid proteins extracted from that HEC293 and um, S F SF9 systems, uh, they were analyzed using that TRD approach. Great, thank you, Paula. We do have a question in here regarding getting a copy of this webinar or a recording. And I wanna mention that this webinar will be available for on-demand viewing after the live broadcast has ended today. So you can just click on the link that you did to join in through the webinar and rewatch it at any time after the presentation. We have a few other questions in here. So we're gonna go ahead and proceed. This next one is coming back to you, Stephen. This asks, do you need special software to calculate the full and empty ratio of AAV? So that's a good question. So for that particular calculation, you don't. And the reason I say that is because the CE um, system software are going, are going to be providing or reporting values for AAV capsid titer uh, using that viral protein workflow. And it's also going to be providing the, um, the genome titer. Uh, for um, uh, from the genome integrity workflow. So those two 
result, you do need the um, the capillary electrophoresis data processing software. However, for the empty, the full to empty product ratio, it's you know just a simple division. So we're using Excel for that calculation, and it's you know very easy uh, to get once you've once you've um, you know used the system to generate your protein and genome titer. Great, thank you. We have one more question that we're going to go ahead and wrap up with for today. And this last question asks, do samples need any pre-processing steps prior to analysis by capillary electrophoresis? Yeah, I think this is um, you know, similar in, in a similar vein to the uh, questions regarding the um, in-process samples um, and pre-treatment workflow. So it, it's all depending on where in the process the samples are coming from and which particular assay you're going to be running. So if it's the CESDS viral protein assay, uh, we will be, you know, there, there's, um, you know, kits available for um, uh, denaturing the proteins and labeling them with fluorescence dye. Also for the genome integrity assay, um, there are those two um, discrete workflows that are available. Uh, the first one is for an analyzing the uh, product related transgene. Uh, only, and that's where we're you know, enabling the use of, of nuclease um, and then doing a nucleic acid extraction to get the, the, the um, uh, to analyze the transgene that's only encapsulated into the AAP particle. And then there's the other workflow, which is just going to be a, um, a PCR prep workflow, essentially is a nucleic acid extraction directly from the total AAV sample. And that's where we can screen for our process end product um, related samples. So, yep, there's always going to be a little bit of pre-processing of these samples, but it's nothing too intensive, and it's um, you know pretty easy to bring these these techniques um, uh, on site. Great. Well, thank you again, Stephen and Paula. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Yeah, I would love to just let everybody know that um, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to take some deeper dives into a few of these workflows specifically. Um, so if you are interested in learning more, we are hosting our masterclass, li masterclass live sessions, which are exactly what they sound like. We're going to be taking some of our experts in-house and basically they'll be able to provide a live demo so that you can see exactly how the workflows are performed start to finish. So you can look forward to those in a couple of weeks. I think we're even hosting one next week. Um, and you can find them, I think, even just by searching for, for Masterclass Live. Thank you, Kaylee. Of course, thank you. We also would like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, SciX, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Now, before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you had provided at the time of registration. As a reminder, this webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>